I feel like an um, honorary Nigerian. <laughs> I, I've yet to go to Nigeria, but I know that I'll be warmly received when I go there. I've Sorry. been embraced by the Nigerian community, uh, Your Excellency here in Ottawa, and it gives me a great pleasure just to stand here before you this morning. I want to start by welcoming the new High Commissioner uh, to the nation's capital. I congratulate you, sir, on your new post, and I look forward to working with you in the years to come uh, as we bridge gaps between Canada and Nigeria. I also want to just, you know, offer uh, just congratulations on behalf of my colleagues in the Senate and our Prime Minister as well. As the fourth African Canadian and the first Jamaican to be appointed to the Senate of Canada, I want to thank you for this great privilege of standing before you today and addressing some of the brightest members of the Nigerian Canadian community. But before I go forward and just share my thoughts with you, I just want to tell you a little bit about me and where I've come from. As my bio indicated, I'm an entrepreneur and professional and an immigrant to this country. I share quite a few of those similarities to the people in this room. Like many of you, I was forced to navigate the unfamiliar land and embrace everything this country has to offer. I was 12 years of age when I came to this beautiful country from the hills of St. Anne's, Jamaica, now all the way to Parliament Hill. So it's a mighty long journey. I lived in the Jane and Finch community where I grew up and a lot of you uh, have heard of that community as being a rough community and so forth. I lived in social housing, I graduated from high school, I studied business at Ryerson and then I went on to form a company when I could no longer, uh, as an executive at American Express, I had a desire for entrepreneurship, I had a desire to start my own business and so that business has been running for 21 years now providing jobs for individuals within the community, and community is very important to me. And so out of that community came uh, the fact that I was able to hire individuals from, from our community, provide them means of sustaining their families. But a tragic thing happened in 2002 when one of my employees' two sons were killed in one night. That began a movement for me as to what I can do as a businessman, somebody who was actively, Your Excellency, involved in church. I went to my pastor at the time and I said, what are we going to do about this crisis in our community? I said, what can I do? I said, sir, I feel compelled that I must do something. And so he gave me his blessings and I said, sir, I'd like to talk to some other faith leaders, talk to some other pastors to say, what can we do about this crisis that is still taking place? And today, that is still happening. So I called up 40 faith leaders and 25 of them showed up to a meeting with now Minister Fantino. He was then commissioner of police at the time. And I said, sir, we're here to help. We're here to provide support. I believe when crisis happens, ladies and gentlemen, in our community, we need to de demonstrate leadership. It's not about finger pointing. It's about bringing solutions to a problem. And that's what I did in 2002 in approaching Jordan County. That began my pilgrimage to form GTA Faith Alliance, an interfaith group connected to finding solutions and ensuring that we're looking at solutions around our young people. I've often said this, that our young people are not only our future, they are our present. And we must look at the challenges that they're facing today. Many years of working in the community, as like David, who was a, a seasoned uh, politician, I ran in Toronto Centre. I lost, but it was a great experience. You know what it is like to put your name out there, and I see a daddy who's also uh, put his name forward for, for campaign, and it's, it's important that we, we get engaged politically. So I learned a valuable lesson. I cannot stand on the sideline as an immigrant to this country. We must get engaged, and David, I'm sure you will concur with that. So as a result of my political engagement, on December 18, the Right Honorable Stephen Harper appointed me to the Senate of Canada as a fourth African Canadian and first Canadian. The power of engagement. The power of engagement is that one of the most important lessons that I've learned along the journey from the hills of St. Anne's to make it to Parliament Hill. This lesson has stayed with me in my new role as I explore new causes like the well-being of the Aboriginal people and work on projects close to my heart like a national youth strategy that I'm developing on the Hill, as well as a monument to recognize the contributions of African Canadians to the Canadian forces. Yes, they're on our websites, but I believe it's time that we bring them out in the open for others to recognize as well.
there are some opportunities in this country that can be realized right. by us embracing education, embracing what this country has to offer. The sky is the limit. I often let young people know, and this is free, this is not in my script, I will not let anyone define me. Do not let anyone define you. You define yourself. And today, we need to get that message loud and clear to our young people, especially in our high schools, who are being told, go into general subjects or you're not going to become anything. That you're looking at someone who my high school teacher and others around me told me I would never become who I am today. But I have defied them because when, oh, I mean, I almost feel like preaching here. Uh, when the hands of God is up on you, nobody can stop you. At all levels of government, there is an obvious lack of representation of visible minorities, a problem that you and I need to solve. Although Canada is the most multicultural country in the world, the diversity hasn't been realized in the corridors of power. Many years ago, the Honorable Lincoln Alexander and Honorable Jean Augustine made history and broke down barriers for future generations. Yet there is still a major shortage of African Canadians in elected office. We need to change that, ladies and gentlemen. We need to get involved and change that. Those of us who immigrated from overseas also have a dual role of being engaged in both Canada and back home. Since being appointed to the Senate, I've been a vested interest in promoting relations between Jamaica, the Caribbean, Canada, and other parts of the world. I've been a strong supporter of free trade between Canada and the Caribbean community because it is my desire that the Caribbean uh, be a center of innovation and prosperity. You and I have a success, thank you, of immeasurable resources and contacts in Canada that could benefit our ancestral homes. In fact, during the celebration of Jamaica's 50th anniversary of independence, I often encourage Jamaican Canadians to reach back and use their resources and contacts that they've gained here in Canada to benefit Jamaica. As your country is facing many obstacles while growing into a regional and international economic force, as we've heard testified here today by the speakers who came forward, that Nigeria is moving ahead. Nigeria is growing, and there are vast opportunities there. It is especially important for the people in this room to engage in the future of Nigeria. On a personal level, I've become immersed in the issues facing African diaspora worldwide, including Nigeria. If you would allow me, I want to just take this opportunity to share my heart on your nation. Last month, former World Bank Vice President of Africa estimated that 400 billion, Your Excellency, of Nigeria's oil revenues have been stolen or misspent since becoming an independent nation in 1960. She has said also that oil accounted for 90% of Nigeria's exports, 80% of the money went to 1% of the population. A 2011 assessment by the African Development Bank paints a more positive picture. According to the ADP, Nigeria has put in place key public financial management reforms to improve resource allocation. The Nigerian government has been working hard to fight corruption through the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission and the Independent Corruption Practices and Other Related Offenses Commission. And Your Excellency, I was also happy to read that as Minister of Transport, you put in an anti-corruption strategy. So let's commend you for that and being a visionary and moving your country forward. Against these odds, we must stand for what is right. If we're going to be blessed as a people, we must do the right thing at all times. If these institutions function correctly, they will go a long way in creating a stable economic landscape that investors and entrepreneurs can trust. As laying in my bed the other night and contemplating this message, and the Lord dropped in my spirit, that the two things that Nigeria needs most and countries around the globe need, transparency and accountability. Transparency and accountability is a magnet that will draw investors to your country and to countries like my country of birth as well. Jamaica is also looking to rid itself of corruption and at all levels. This year, the current administration committed to bringing together its various anti-corruption functions under a single new agency. It is believed this merger will allow the government to place a more concentrated focus on the problem of corruption, both in the public and private sector. Jamaica's Minister of Justice, the Honorable Senator Mark Golden, said 
this of the country's anti-corruption efforts, we must look into ourselves and commit to ensuring that we are not accomplices in the spread of this cancer in our society. We must rid ourselves of our national bad habits, which have led us to this dire state of affairs. What our people need to understand is that in order for any country to progress, there must be an equitable distribution of wealth. One of my deepest desires, ladies and gentlemen, today is for Jamaica and Nigeria to continue to grow and that be a trusted and international centers for investment and development that are able to create countless jobs and opportunities for its people. Jobs are very important. As I see the educated young people of Jamaica, Your Excellency, and I see it of your people as well, we must create opportunities where they can gain gainful employment. Yes. Go ahead. You know, the Lord gave us instruments of ten strings, so. <laughs> this brings me to another issue that is very close to my heart, Your Excellency, as a man of faith and a leader in the community, that of religious persecution. Earlier this year, I issued a statement denouncing the Christmas Day attack on St. Teresa's Church outside Abuja. It was reassuring to see political and faith leaders respond quickly to keep the peace. It is my desire to see Niger become the center of hope and opportunity that is supposed to be within the African continent. This can only happen if it is... This can only happen if its tremendous economic growth is coupled with a sense of religious tolerance. This is why Canada's Office of Religious Freedom is so important. This office demonstrates that defending persecuted religious minorities is a foreign policy priority for our government. As a faith leader and co-founder of the GTA Faith Alliance, I can't stress enough how important religious tolerance is to promoting democracy. As Nigerian Canadians, who now call this country home. I encourage you to be ambassadors of religious tolerance in your ancestral home, not only for the benefit of people of faith, but for, the, for all the people of Nigeria who desire to live in, in safety and in a just society. Finally, the obstacle, another obstacle that I'd like to raise with you, the final obstacle that can and will overcome in the coming is a stereotype of African people. This is something that is near and dear to my heart. For over 20 years, David Kilgore, you've seen this. Canadians have turned on their television and seen pictures of African children with swollen bellies, flies around them and so forth, living in small huts and sense of hopelessness in their faces. This might be the reality for some African people. The media has failed to capture, however, the Africa that you and I know. The Africa, a land rich in beauty, and natural resources and human resources. It is a vibrant cultural from which black people all over the world can trace its roots. It has qualified professionals across the globe and you're sitting right here in this room from Asia to North America. It's these natural and human resources that will lead Africa into prosperity. So what is it going to take? At the African Legislative Conference in March of this year, Rwanda's president, Paul Kagame, told representatives from 40 African countries. There is no two ways about it, he stated. The private sector will drive Africa's economic growth and bring about the prosperity our people need and deserve. He went on to note that Rwanda and in many of the African countries achieving and sustaining true economic development will depend on their ability to mobilize domestic and international investments, investments from the private sector. So where does this leave Nigeria? Where does your country stand in all of this? As you know, Nigeria is the most populous country in Africa, the most populous country in the world with the majority of its population being black, and the seventh most populous country in the world. Nigeria's economic growth has averaged an incredible 7.4% annually over the past decade, and all the economists in the room can probably say those figures are accurate and blame me if I, my research is not correct. <laughs> Although these statistics indicate that Nigeria has what it takes to be a prosperous country, 
They don't tell the full story of where Nigeria is going as a nation. On top of being the most populous country in the continent, over 40% of Nigeria's population is under 14 years of age compared to 31% of South Africa. While the world's population is getting older, Nigeria's population is getting young and strong. Yes. This means the future of Nigeria hinges on its youth. It also means there is an unprecedented opportunity for the people in this room to groom the Nigerian leaders of tomorrow and set the country on a new course. That's right. Looking at the economy, PricewaterhouseCooper, one of the most reputable accounting firms in the world, projects that Nigeria will not only become the largest economy in Africa within the next few years, but by 2050 will surpass the former economic powers of Spain, Italy, to become one of the largest, one of the 20 largest economies of the world. Ladies and gentlemen, this means I will see the day when Nigeria is not only the leading economy in Africa, but the leading economy in Africa. Can I say that again? Oh, yes. It means Nigeria will be the Africa what the United States is to North America, or what Germany is to Europe. While this reason to celebrate, we must also embrace the fact that with a sense of sobriety, what does it really mean to be the leading economy within a continent? It means your country will be seen as a place of hope and opportunity for all across Africa. It means your country must bear the responsibility of being an example and a source of pride, not only for Africans, but black people across the globe. Here in Canada, friends, Nigeria grows to be a leading international economy, one country it will always be able to count on as a friend and as a partner is Canada. Yeah. Last year, the two-way trade between our two countries reached $2.7 billion. That makes Nigeria Canada's largest trading partner in the sub-Saharan Africa. Canada's export to Nigeria has increased by more than 300% over the past eight years. When it comes to relations with Canada, I believe the day will come when both Nigeria and Jamaica will stand shoulder to shoulder with Canada, not as countries in need, but as equal partners. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, this is where the preacher says, I'm coming down. <laughs> Can the organist come, please? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, my life has continued to reflect the power of being engaged. I want to once again encourage you to be engaged both here in Canada and back home in Nigeria. As Nigerian Canadians, you're in a unique position to bridge the gap between our two great nations, an emerging economic force and a center for freedom and democracy. You are also in a unique position to be ambassadors of hope for the people of Nigeria and the shoulders upon which the next generation will stand. Sir Winston Churchill said this, we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. Right. As a business people and professional, let us not forget that as we work every day to make a living, the ultimate goal is to make a life by being engaged in the lives of others. Thank you, God bless you, and God bless this great country.